Jasvina Vadita Mastu Ma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, welcome everyone and namaste. Uh, we are meeting on Tuesday nights to read and discuss the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, one of the more remarkable books produced in this or any century. Uh, well, actually, it was produced in the last uh, couple of centuries, but uh, it is continuing, of course, to be published and and read constantly now, as we are going to do this evening. <clears throat> uh, our reader is our beloved Haima Didi. And we're going to start with the introduction by Swami Nikilananda, assisted by a number of other people, as he uh, noted in the acknowledgments. So before we start, are there any comments from your own wisdom or experience or any concern or question that you'd like to raise about what it is that we're going to discuss or any other topic that is material to this kind of class. All right, Haima, thanks for your service as always. Please I'm read honored, on. Brother. I'm honored, Brother Shankara. I will start with the introduction. It's a PDF on, it's a page 12. Introduction by Swami Nikhilananda. <clears throat> Sri Ramakrishna, the godman of modern India, was born at Kamarpakur. This village in the Hooghly district preserved during the last century the idyllic simplicity of the rural areas of Bengal. Situated far from the railway, it was untouched by the glamour of the city. <coughs> it contained rice fields, tall palms, royal banyans, <coughs> a few lakes, and two cremation grounds. <sighs> Bless you, Brother Shankar. Thank you, dear. Please go ahead. Uh -huh. South of the village, a stream took its leisurely course. A mango orchard dedicated by a neighboring Jamindar <coughs> the public use was frequented by the boys for their noonday sports. A highway passed through the village to the great temple of Jagannath at Puri and the villagers most of whom were farmers and craftsmen, entertained many passing holy men and pilgrims. 
the dull round of the rural life was broken by lively festivals, the observance of sacred days, religious singing, and other innocent pleasures. About his parents, Sri Ramakrishna once said, my mother was the personification of rectitude and gentleness. She did not know much about the ways of the world, innocent of the art of concealment. She would say what was in her mind. People loved her for open hearted, for open, heart, open heartedness. My father, an Orthodox Brahmin, never accepted gifts from the Sudras. He spent much of his time in worship and meditation and in repeating God's name and chanting his glories. Whenever in his daily prayers, he invoked the goddess Gayatri, his chest flushed and tears rolled down his cheeks. He spent his leisure hours making garlands for the family deity Raghuvir. Raghuvir is considered as Sri Rama. What I have known, Raghuvir is Rama. Yes, it's a form of right. Rama, that's correct. Right, Brother Shankara? Okay. Kudiram Chetopajaya and Chandra Devi, the parents of Sri Ramakrishna, were married in 1799. At that time, Kudiram was living in his ancestral village of Derapur, not far from Kamarpukur. Their first son, Ram Kumar, was born in 1805, and their first daughter, Kachayani, in 1810. In 1814, Kudiram was ordered by his landlord to bear false witness in court against a neighbor. When he refused to do so, the landlord brought a false case against him and deprived him of his ancestral property. Thus dispossessed, he arrived at the invitation of another landlord in the quiet village of Kamarpukur, where he was given a dwelling and about an acre of fertile land. The crops from this little property were enough to meet his family's simple needs. Here, he lived in simplicity, dignity, and contentment. Ten years after his coming to Kamarpukur, Puriram made a pilgrimage on foot to Rameshwar at the southern extremity of India. Two years later was born his second son, whom he named Rameshwar. Again in 1835, at the age of 60, he made a pilgrimage, this time to Gaya. Here from ancient times, Hindus have come from the four corners of India to discharge their duties to their departed ancestors by offering them food and drink at the sacred footprint of the Lord Vishnu. At this holy place, Puriram had a dream in which the Lord Vishnu promised to be born as his son. And Chandra Devi too, in front of the Shiva temple at Kamarpukur, had a vision indicating the birth of a divine child. Upon his return, the husband found that she had conceived. It was on February 18, 1836, that the child to be known afterwards as Ramakrishna was born. Now, let's, let's just pause and marvel at this virgin birth. Kudiram makes this pilgrimage to Gaya. He's visited by Vishnu in this dream vision, who says he's pleased with his service. <clears throat> and uh, as it would be lovely, lovely if you could hear him say it, Swami Sarvadevananda said, green as a pea pod. 
Vishnu was green as a peapot, appearing uh, to uh, to uh, Kudiram and saying, I will be born as your son. Kudiram immediately protested in the dream, saying, oh, we're too poor to, to uh, because, you know, in, in the past, these great ones had been born as kings and uh, you know, there was quite a bit of uh, fanfare and activity associated with their with their birth and their their growing up. Vishnu said, "Don't don't worry about that. I'll take care of all of that." And indeed, he did. Now, this vision that Chandra Devi had. There was a small Shiva temple in the village of Kamarpakur. She was passing that uh, Shiva temple when a light, and uh, she said it felt like a wind and energy came rushing out of the temple and entered her womb. And she said she knew at that moment that she had conceived. And so she told some of her trusted neighbors about this. And of course, she told Kudiram as soon as he came home. And he related to her his experience in Gaia. And so now we'll pick up with uh, the date on which Sri Ramakrishna or Gadadhar, as he was known in his childhood. Gadadhar <coughs> is a form of Sri Krishna, the wielder of the mace. <coughs> we'll talk about that a bit later on, why this wielder of the mace uh, personification is significant. But he was known as Gadadhar or Gadai. Uh, and that's how Holy Mother referred to him uh, all, of, uh, all of his life. She referred to him either as Gadai or the Master. So by Holy Mother, I mean the, the Sri Ramakrishna's wife once he became married, not his mother. His mother, of course, called him Gadadhar or Gadai. Anything else while we're paused? Any? Anything else to be contributed by anyone to this narrative of the Master's uh, advent in, uh, in this unusual but actually very typical way for an avatar to be born? All right. Uh, I'll go ahead. It was on February 18th, 1836, that the child to be known afterwards as Ramakrishna was born. <coughs> In memory of the dream at Gaya, he was given the name of Gadadhar, the bearer of the maze, an epithet of Vishnu. Three years later, a little sister was born. Boyhood. Gadadhar grew up into a healthy and restless boy, hmm. full of fun and sweet mischief. He was intelligent and precocious and endowed with a prodigious memory. On his father's lap, he learned by heart the names of his ancestors and the hymns to the gods and goddesses. And at the village school, he was taught to read and write. But his greatest delight was to listen to recite recitations of stories from Hindu mythology and the epics. These he would afterwards recount from memory to the great joy of the villagers. Painting he enjoyed, the art of molding images of the gods and goddesses he learned he learned from the potters. 
but arithmetic was his great aversion. At the age of six or seven, Garadar had his first experience of spiritual ecstasy. One uh, day, let's, let's just pause for sure, a moment. Sure, sure, brother. Sure. Um, uh, two things. First of all, if you want to know more about the boyhood of Sri Ramakrishna, this restless, joyous, creative boy. <clears throat> the opening chapters of the Punti, P-U-N-T-H-I, um, which is translated as a portrait of Sri Ramakrishna by Akshay Kumar Sen, a, a direct disciple of the master. Uh, the Punti in the opening chapters tells the story of the master's boyhood in such charming and loving detail. So if you want to know more about that, uh, that's, uh, that's where you will find it. So uh, he indeed was uh, fun-loving, mischievous, creative, and this business of, of memorizing whatever it was that he heard. I mean, it is, uh, Haim already was endowed with what the Swami calls a prodigious memory. Well, it was, it was flawless. Whatever he heard, he could recall it. And to the great delight of the sadhus, um, you know, they would, uh, they would, uh, he would join these sadhus at their camp, where they camped on the on the road, this highway from, uh, that passed through Kumar Pukur to Puri. And they would recite uh, narratives from the epics and so on and so forth. And then uh, they would come back, coming back the other way. And Sri Ramakrishna would <clears throat> repeat to them word for word what they had said. And they were, of course, astonished. And, and uh, also he was uh, quite uh, skilled at resolving uh, spiritual disputes, even when he was just a child. This was said of Christ as well, of course, that... Uh, he would, uh, that uh, Lord Jesus would uh, would straighten out the rabbis when they got into an argument about the Torah, or what have you. Well, Sri Ramakrishna also would shed light on uh, aspects of the scriptures and interpretations of the scriptures that had not been thought of by others. <clears throat> So we'll pick it up with his, uh, with uh, what Haima was just about to read, which I had in my mind, and then it slipped away. Go ahead, dear. Okay. At the age of six or seven, Gadadhar had his first experience of spiritual ecstasy. One day in June or July, when he was walking along a narrow path between paddy fields, eating the puffed rice that he carried in a basket, he looked up at the sky and saw a beautiful dark thundercloud. As, as it spread, rapidly enveloping the whole sky, a flight of snow white cranes passed in front of it. The beauty of the contrast overwhelmed the boy. He fell to the ground unconscious and the puffed rice went in all directions. <laughs> Some villagers found him and carried him home in their arms. Garadar said later that in that state, he had experienced an indescribable joy. Garadar was seven years old when his, when his father died. This incident profoundly affected him. For the first time, the boy realized that life on earth was impermanent. 
unobserved by others, he began to slip into the mango orchard or into one of the cremation grounds, and he spent hours absorbed in his own thoughts. He also became more helpful to his mother in the discharge of her household duties. <coughs> he gave more attention to reading and hearing the religious stories recorded in the Puranas. And he became interested in the wandering monks and pious pilgrims who would stop at Kam Kamarpakur on their way to Puri. Again now, if you want to know more details about these episodes of, of, of Sri Ramakrishna's life, they're lovingly and in great detail described in that book that I mentioned, the Punti, the portrait of Sri Ramakrishna by Akshay Kumar Sen. This book is of course available for purchase, um, either from Vedanta.com or uh, you know you can buy used copies if you wish uh, through other sources. Uh, it's it's a wonderful wonderful read. Uh, so, and in the event, there we are. That's uh, that's my little commercial for the punti. <laughs> Anything else from anyone while we're paused? All right, please read on, dear. He gave more attention to reading and hearing the religious stories recorded in the Pur in the Puranas, and he became interested in the wandering monks and pious pilgrims who would stop at Kamarpakur on their way to Puri. These holy men, the custodians of India's spiritual heritage and the living witnesses of the ideal of renunciation of the world and all absorbing love of God, entertain the little boy with stories from the Hindu epics, stories of saints and prophets, and also stories of their own adventures. He, on his part, fetched their water and fuel and served them in various ways. Meanwhile, he was observing their meditation and worship. At the age of nine, Gadadhar was invested with the sacred thread. This ceremony conferred upon him the privileges of his Brahmin lineage, including the worship of the family deity, Raghavir, and imposed upon him the many strict disciplines of, of a Brahmin's life. During the ceremony of investiture, he shocked his relatives by accepting a meal cooked by his nurse, a Shudra woman. His father would never have dreamt of doing such a thing. But in a playful mood, Garadar had once promised this woman that he would eat her food, and now he fulfilled his plighted word. The woman had piety and religious sincerity, and these were more important to the boy than the conventions, conventions of society. And this was the beginning of something that was one of the hallmarks of Sri Ramakrishna's life, that he would ignore or even advise against these caste restrictions and the limitations that these put on people. Uh, oftentimes he would eat the food of low caste uh, people when he was, uh, uh, first of all, uh, starting with the, the Dakshineshwar temple. The, the Dakshineshwar temple was started by uh, a woman of the fisherwoman caste, fisher, fisherman caste, a Rani Rasmani. And uh, after some hesitation, he began to take the prasad of Mother Kali as, as, uh, as presented there. And then uh, this generalized, and so he would encourage his Brahmin followers 
to uh, ignore their caste restrictions and eat the food offered to them by people of lower castes. Some of them followed that and some of them did not as well. Here as we go on, this is much later in the gospel. But uh, this was, I just wanted to note that this uh, accepting the food from Dani, this uh, a blacksmith a woman, uh, woman of the blacksmith caste, uh, was shocking. And he wouldn't accept the sacred thread unless he actually went and shut himself up in his room and said, I won't come out and go through with the ceremony unless you'll let me eat her food. And so finally it was relented and uh, he did eat her food and then he went ahead with the sacred thread ceremony. Any questions or concerns or thoughts about that? All right, tears. Please go, please go ahead. Garadar was now permitted to worship Raghuvir. Thus began his first training in meditation. He so gave his heart and soul to the worship that the stone image very soon appeared to him as the living Lord of the universe. His tendency to lose himself in contemplation was first noticed at this time. Beyond his boyish lightheartedness was seen a deepening of his spiritual nature. About this time, on the Shivaratri night, consecrated to the worship of Shiva, a dramatic performance was arranged. The principal actor who was to play the part of Shiva suddenly fell ill and Garadar was persuaded to act in his place. While friends were dressing him for the role of Shiva, smearing his body with ashes, matting, mat, matting his locks, placing a trident in his hand, and a string of Rudraksha beads around his neck, the up boy appeared to become absent-minded. He approached the stage with the slow and measured step supported by his friends. He looked the living image of Seva. The audience loudly applauded what it took to be his skill as an actor, but it was soon discovered that he was really lost in meditation. His countenance was radiant and tears flowed from his eyes. He was lost to the outer world. The effect of this scene on the audience was tremendous. The people felt blessed as by a vision of Seva himself. The performance had to be stopped and the boy's mood lasted till the following morning. Garadar himself now organized a dramatic company with his young friends. The stage was set in the mango orchard. The themes were selected from the stories of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Garadar knew by heart almost all the roles, having heard them from professional actors. His favorite theme was the Vrindavan episode of Krishna's life, depicting those exquisite love stories of Krishna and the milkmaids and the cowherd boys. Gadadhar would play the parts of Radha or Krishna and would often lose himself in the character he was portraying. Let's pause here. Mm -hmm. This, this so-called Rasa Lila, this divine sweet play, Rasa, the sweet divine play of Sri Krishna as a boy with the cowherd uh, boys and the, cow, the milkmaids of Vrindavan remained a favorite uh, theme of Sri Ramakrishna's throughout his life. 
he loved the stories and uh, he was remembering what act, what had happened of course uh, it's the uh, it's understood that Sri Ramakrishna in previous un- incarnations was Krishna was Rama was Krishna he said so himself and uh, pointing to his body he said he, he who was Rama he who was Krishna is present here pointing to his body as Ramakrishna so he was remembering these incidents and he also remembered his incarnation <laughs> as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, we'll come we'll come to that uh, in time it, it has to do with his relationship with M Mahendranath Gupta the, the man who uh, formed uh, took his diaries and from them uh, wrote the Katamrita or Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So anything else from anyone while we're paused about this or anything else? All right, tears, let's read on. His natural feminine grace heightened the dramatic effect. The mango orchard would ring with the loud kirtan of the boys. Lost in song and merrymaking, Garadar became indifferent to the routine of school. In 1849, Ram Kumar, the eldest son, went to Calcutta to improve the financial condition of the family. Now, this was a typical thing for a Brahmin priest to do. Ram Kumar was, of course, also a Brahmin priest, the son of Kuriram and uh, Chandramani. And uh, the family was large enough to where that one acre of land wasn't quite enough to to support them all, and particularly to provide for their education and so on. And so Ram Kumar went to Kolkata, Calcutta that we called them, and uh, and took up the the job of of a priest. And this is how uh, he came to uh, serve at Dakshineshwar, the uh, Rani Rasmani's tem- Kali temple, and how Sri Ramakrishna came there. We'll, we'll hear all of this. But uh, this is a very typical thing for a village Brahmin to do, a well-educated village Brahmin, to go to the city to uh, perform ceremonies rites and rituals uh, in, uh, for uh, families who could afford to make some donation in response, uh, offer some pranami uh, as, a, as, a, as a gift. And so this is why Ram Kumar went to Calcutta. So you might want to read that again, dear. Just sure, Brother Shankara. In 1849, Ram Kumar, the eldest son, went to Calcutta to improve the financial condition of the family. Gadadar was on the threshold of youth. He had become the pet of the woman of the village. They loved to hear him talk, sing, or recite from the holy books. They enjoyed his knack of imitating voices. Their woman's instinct recognized the innate purity and guilelessness of this boy of clear skin, flowing hair, beaming eyes, smiling face, and in inexhaustible fun. The pious- Read that again, please. Sure. How, how the village women loved him. Yeah. I mean, this, it... these episodes of the master's life are just absolutely entrancing. Yeah. Uh, the, these, these, these years, when he is from 12 up to 15, 16 years old. Garadar was at the threshold of youth. He had become the pet of the woman of the village. They loved to hear him talk, sing or recite from the holy books. They enjoyed his knack of imitating voices. Their woman's instinct 
recognized the innate purity and guilelessness of this boy of clear skin, flowing hair, beaming eyes, smiling face, and inexhaustible fun. The pious elderly woman looked upon him as Gopala, that's the baby Krishna, and the younger one saw in him the youthful Krishna of Vrindavan. He himself so idealized the love of the gopis for Krishna that he sometimes yearned to be born as a woman if he must be born again in order to be able to love Sri Krishna with all his heart and soul. Yes, and, and uh, in this he mirrored Mirabai, and, uh, and it was very sincere. He, he uh, after the loss of his father, this business of being, uh, of, of leaving this world and, and returning in some other form became very real to him. And so he did uh, yearn, as, as Mirabai said, don't give me liberation. Let me come back again and again to, uh, to dance and play and, and, uh, uh, and love my Krishna. And uh, so this was uh, Gadadhar's uh, wish also. So please read that again, dear. Sure. The pious elderly woman looked upon as Gopala, the baby Krishna, and the younger one saw in him the youthful Krishna of Vrindavan. He himself so idealized the love of the gopis for Krishna that he sometimes yearned to be born as a woman if he must be born again in order to be able to love Sri Krishna with all his heart and soul. This was his identification with Radha. It's mm. said that in the incarnation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that Krishna and Radha did in fact incarnate together in one body. Uh, so that they could experience their union uh, in this very pure and uh, uh, spiritually uh, fulfilled way. Uh, if you study the life, read the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, <clears throat> you see that this is, that this is, he, again, it was mentioned that the master, Sri Ramakrishna, had the ability to to become a woman at a moment's notice, uh, behave as a woman, uh, act as a woman, look like a woman. Well, Sri Chaitanya also had this uh, aspect to him. And it was rather shocking, actually, to, to some people at that time. Uh, when, when he was born at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the 15th century, born in the 15th century, the 1400s. Anything else from anyone while we paused? Okay, please read that again, dear, and go ahead. Okay, you want me to read that paragraph one more time, Brother Shankara? Yes, please. Sure, in 1849, Ram Kumar, the eldest son, went to Calcutta to improve the financial condition of the family. Gadadhar was on the threshold of youth. He had become the pet of the women of the village. They loved to hear him talk, sing, or recite from the holy books. They enjoyed his knack of imitating voices. Their woman's instinct recognized the innate purity and guilelessness of this boy of clear skin, flowing hair, beaming eyes, smiling face, <clears throat> and inexhaustible fun. The pious elderly woman looked upon him as Gopala, the baby Krishna, and the younger ones saw in him the youthful Krishna of Vrindavan. He himself so idealized the love of the gopis for Krishna that he sometimes yearned to be born as a woman if he must be born again 
in order to be able to love Sri Krishna with all his heart and soul. Next is coming to Calcutta. At the age of 16, Gadadhar was summoned to Calcutta by his elder brother Ram Kumar, who wished assistance in his priestly duties. Ram Kumar had opened a Sanskrit academy to supplement his income, and it was his intention gradually to turn his younger brother's mind to education. Mm -hmm. Gadadhar applied himself heart and soul to his new duty as family priest to a number of Calcutta families. His worship was very different from that of the professional priests. He spent hours decorating the images and singing hymns and devotional songs. These families he, would, would uh, uh, they, he became very popular with these families, by the by. But <clears throat> these families, <clears throat> they would want rites and rituals done by Brahmin priests. And, you know, most of the priests would come and uh, do the do the rites and rituals uh, in an expeditious manner, <clears throat> pick up their pranami and be gone. Well, <laughs> this Sri Ramakrishna or Gadadhar still uh, was uh, just exactly the opposite. He he would absolutely ennoble the images that they had at their home the ones that they wanted to have worship by by just devoting himself to them because he saw them as real he did not see them as murtis as images he saw them as the reality behind the image and so when he was decorating them or feeding them or or reciting the mantras to them. It was as if he was in the room with the being itself, that deva or devi or, or whoever it was that was being worshiped. This is, again, something that only an incarnation can bring this level of intentionality and uh, focus and reality to what they're doing. Sri Ramakrishna said only an incarnation or the Ishwara Kotis, the ever free souls that come with an incarnation. Ishwara Koti Ishwara, the incarnation, a Koti follower or, or those who come with. So please read again that, that sentence um, about uh, how he performed sure. the worship. I'll read this one more time. Coming to Calcutta, at the age of 16, Gadadhar was summoned to Calcutta by his elder brother Ram Kumar, who wished assistance in his priestly duties. Ram Kumar had opened a Sanskrit academy to supplement his income, and it was his intention gradually to turn his younger brother's mind to education. Garadhar applied himself heart and soul to his new duty as family priest to a number of Calcutta families. His worship was very different from that of the professional priests. <laughs> he spent hours decorating the images and singing hymns and devotional songs. He performed with love the other duties of his office. People were impressed with his ardor, but to his studies, he paid scant attention. <laughs> Ram Kumar did not at first oppose the ways of his temperamental brother. He wanted Garadhar to become used to the conditions of city life. But one day he decided to warn the boy about his indifference to the world. After all, in the near future, 
Garadar must, as a householder, earn his livelihood through the performance of his Brahminical duties. And these required a thorough knowledge of Hindu law, astrology, and kindred subjects. He gently admonished Garadar and asked him to pay more attention to his studies. But the boy replied spiritedly, Brother, what shall I do with a mere breadwinning education? I would rather acquire that wisdom which will illumine my, illumine my heart and give me satisfaction forever. Can I read this one more time, Brother Shankar? Yes, and, and <laughs> let's, let's, when it said that he said this spiritedly, yes. this is somewhat euphemistic. He absolutely, categorically refused to get this, as he referred to it, breadwinning education. This, this education that will allow him to fulfill his, uh, to, to complete uh, his priestly uh, adornments, as it were, uh, his education, so that he knew law and astrology and all these things. And he said, I want to know that by which all else is known. I don't want, and so, you know, I want to know that by which all else is known. In other words, I want illumination. It's only in the illumination that one achieves the state where uh, one knows that by which all else is known, which of course is a way of saying omniscience. Again, before Haima reads again, anything else from anyone about this particular aspect of the master and his development as he age, went from age 16 to age 19 in uh, Calcutta. All right, dear, please read it again. Yeah. People were impressed with his ardor but to his studies, he paid scant attention. Ram Kumar did not at first oppose the ways of his temperamental brother. He wanted Garadar to become used to the conditions of city life. But one day, he decided to warn the boy about his indifference to the world. After all, in the near future, Garadar must, as a householder, earn his livelihood through the performance of his <clears throat> Brahminical duties. And these required a thorough knowledge of Hindu law, astrology, and kindred subjects. He gently admonished Garadar and asked him to pay more attention to his studies. But the boy replied spiritedly, brother, what shall I do with a mere breadwinning education? I would rather acquire that wisdom which will illumine my heart and give me satisfaction forever. Next, breadwinning education. The anguish of the inner soul of India found expression through these passionate words of the young Garadhar. For what did his unsophisticated eyes see around him in Calcutta. At that time, the metropolis of India and the center of modern culture and learning. Greed and lust held sway in the higher levels of society. Metropolis, the, the word is metropolis, dear, and it meant met, capital. Met, it metropolis. Was, at that time, uh, the capital of India, the, of British India was Calcutta. It had not yet moved to Delhi or New Delhi. So that's so read that again. And the word is metropolis. Metropolis. Breadwinning education, the anguish of the inner soul of India found expression through these passionate words of the Eng Garadar. For what did his unsophisticated eyes see around him in Calcutta? At that time, 
the metropolis of India and the center of modern culture and learning? Greed and lust held sway in the higher levels of society and the occasional religious practices were merely outer forms from which the soul had long ago departed. Garadar had never seen anything like this at Kamarpakur among the simple and pious villagers. The sadhus and wandering monks whom he had served in his boyhood had revealed to him an altogether different India. He had been impressed by their devotion and purity, their self-control and renunciation. He had learned from them and from his own intuition that the ideal of life as taught by the ancient sages of India was the realization of God. I would read the sentence one more time. This Gadadhar had never seen anything like this at Kamarpakur among the simple and pious villagers. The sadhus and wandering monks whom he had served in his boyhood had revealed to him an altogether different India. He had been impressed by their devotion and purity, their self-control and renunciation. He had learned from them and from his own intuition that the ideal of life as taught by the ancient sages of India was the realization of God. And if you remember, if you go through the Upanishads, um, this is the theme of all of the Upanishads. These are the ecstatic uh, utterances of people who have experienced realization. I say experienced. They have been in the state of realization. It's not an experience because there's no experiencer there. But they come back and those who do return to the body are the ones who left behind these teachings called the Upanishads. And so in each Upanishad, we find the ecstatic uh, utterance, uh, uh, utterances of someone who has experienced or has been in the state of uh, nirvikalpa samadhi and uh, has returned to the body and voices to us that the purpose of human life is the realization of God. And this, of course, became the theme of Sri Ramakrishna's life and therefore of Swami Vivekananda's and Brahmananda's and for that matter, the Ramakrishna order. And so if you take uh, instruction from one of the Ramakrishna order Swamis, who is in that line of apostolic succession from Sri Ramakrishna, this is the message you receive. That the purpose of your life is, uh, you must do your duties, of course, but the purpose of your life is to realize God, to know God, as Sri Ramakrishna said. First know God, then go about your life. Anything else from anyone while we're stopped? All right, dear, we've got a few minutes left. Please read on. When Ram Kumar reprimanded Gadadhar for neglecting a breadwinning education, the inner voice of the boy reminded him that the legacy of his ancestors, the legacy of Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Shankara, Ramanuja, Chaitanya, was not worldly security, but the knowledge of God. And these noble sages were the true representatives of Hindu society. Each of them was seated, as it were, on the crest of the wave that followed each successive trough 
in the tumultuous course of Indian national life. All demonstrated that the life current of India is spirituality. <clears throat> this truth was revealed to Garadar through that inner vision which scans past and future in one sweep, unobstructed by the barriers of time and space. Now, this is again a statement of omniscience. Hmm? Omniscience. So read that sentence again with that in mind, that what is being described as Sri Ramakrishna's, even as this youth, he possessed the, the master of the universe's <coughs> omniscience. So please read that again, dear. Sure, Brother Shankara. When Ramkumar reprimanded Garadar for neglecting a breadwinning education, the inner voice of the boy reminded him that the legacy of his ancestors, the legacy of Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Shankara, Ramanuja, Chaitanya, was not worldly security, but the knowledge of God. And these noble sages were the true representatives of Hindu society. Each of them was seated, as it were, on the crest of the wave that followed each successive trough in the tumultuous course of Indian national life. All demonstrated that the life current of India is spirituality. This truth was revealed to Garadar through that inner vision which scans the past and future in one sweep, unobstructed by the barriers of time and space. But he was unaware of the history of the profound change that had taken place in the land of his birth during the previous 100 years. Hindu society during the 18th century had been passing through a period of decadence. It was the twilight of the Muslim rule. There were anarchy and confusion in all spheres. Superstitious practices dominated the religious life of the people. Rites and rituals passed for the essence of spirituality. Greedy priests became the custodians of heaven. True philosophy was supplanted by dogmatic opinions. The pundits took delight in vain polemics. In 1757, English traders laid the foundation of British rule in India. Gradually, the government was systematized and lawlessness suppressed. The Hindus were much impressed by the military power and the political acumen of the new rulers. In the wake of the merchants came the English educators and social reformers and Christian missionaries, all bearing a culture of completely alien to the Hindu mind. In different parts of the country, educational institutions were set up and Christian churches established. Hindu young men were offered the heady wine of the Western culture of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and they drank it to the very dregs. Calcutta was known as the Paris of India. It was really quite a metropolis, quite a capital. Uh, it it just absolutely anything was on anything that you could pay for you could have anything and so it, it was this was the this was the capital of the emerging Raj the emerging <coughs> jewel in the crown of Queen Victoria. <coughs> And so uh, that way it was to become that. And so uh, it was, 
we'll we'll pick it up next week with reading yeah. these sentences again. Sure, Brother Shankar. These this is uh, India at the at the, that time, as the as the as it said as the Muslims as the Muslim rule was uh, fading and and it become so uh, they quarreled among one another and were were everything was chaotic and so on. So the British East India came India company came in the 1750s and began to establish what became the British rule of India. And this is what is the summer. The Swami has just summarized. Any comments or concerns or questions from anyone about any of that before we close? I just want to uh, make uh just a, want to share a thought that that uh, the before the British came the twilight of uh, the Muslim rule what uh, what what Swami is mentioning here uh, that is pretty much the scene in entire Islam uh, I know that uh, some of you may disagree with it but uh, maybe some percentage of people are joining devotees. Uh, and obviously they go through all that, but after a detailed study and analysis and after reading so much and watching so much of things, we see a similar religion and that is what it has uh, come to. And uh, we can see how it has disintegrated into so many other, other issues which it creates today. But uh, Hinduism, luckily we have had so many saints coming in every time from different parts of the country. Now, there is a little bit of uh, sentiment here, more emotional sentiment here of Swamiji that uh, without Sri Ramakrishna or without Vivekananda, there would have not have been anything or it was just completely lawlessness uh, about, uh, I, I kind of disagree that there, are, there were so many other traditions, even in Bengal, uh, which were very strong and there were people. Who, now about Cal Calcutta, I would say he is probably right. But in Bengal, or even in other parts of India, you take South India, you take <coughs> West India, or North India, there were so many other spiritual traditions going along and several saints coming up every few hundred years, every... Uh, so uh, it's amazing uh, how India, and if you look at other religions, like I said, uh, or even Christianity now, uh, the, the, that has that has sustained and, 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 and great saints like Thakur and Swamiji, absolutely, these are the great, big, giant, huge tsunamis, I would say, and not waves, but uh, which brought all this uh, back uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, uh, where we are here. Thank you, Sharlesh. All very carefully observed, as you said, very thoughtfully presented. So we'll leave it at that. If there's nothing else from anyone, we'll leave it at that for the, for the evening. Hmm. Om Hari Om. Om Ma Satoma Satkamaya. Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya. Mityor Ma Amritangamaya. Abir Abir Moiti. O oh, dearly beloved Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from this realm of endless noise and relentless deception to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness to light Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through. Light us through and through with thy everlasting, shining presence. Hari Om Tat Sat. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai. Durga, Durga, Durga. May we all be safe.
May we all be healthy. May we all be cheerful. May we all have peace of mind. And may we be always, and know we are always, in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Om Hari Om Tat Sat. O beloved, make it so. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. So if there's nothing from anyone else, uh, I'll close for this evening. And uh, of course, there's tomorrow evening's class on the Gita. And uh, then Saturday, there's our reading and discussion of how to know God. Swami Prabhupada's translation of and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And then on Sunday, there'll be a uh, a talk titled, Whose Karma Is It? Whose Karma Is It? So that's what will happen until next Tuesday. Again, any final thought from anyone? All right, dears. Thank you, Hamaji, for reading wonderfully. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. I'm honored. I'm honored and privileged. Well, thank you, Hamaji. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Brother Shankara. Oh, thank you, Shankara. you, dears. Thank you, Brother Shankara. Thank you all for thank being you all for the company. with us. Good night.